Thank you. Thank you for having me here tonight. I really appreciate it. You know, when I was 13 years old, I had the most amazing gift given to me that you could possibly imagine. I was out at Apple Creek, not far from where we're sitting right now, and we were playing pirates. We had two canoes full of kids, 13-year-olds, 14-year-olds. We would come at each other, and the job was to jump out of the canoe and try and sink the other one. We had a steel bottom canoe that, of course, if you got water in, went to the bottom. They had an aluminum canoe that if you got water in it, it floated. Well, I was 13, I didn't know that. I was about 70 pounds, so my job was to stay in the canoe and row it away if, when my people jumped out. That happened, and I was rowing it away. They came at it, they sank it, it started to sink. The rope that you tie it to the dock was tighter on my foot, and it pulled me to the bottom. Now, I was wearing my life jacket, so I couldn't go up any further or go down to untie it, and as the boat sank, it pulled me down. Um, the gift that I received was the most amazing gift ever because it was the gift of death. I was underwater for about seven minutes, which is a very long time, according to the witnesses, seven minutes, because at three minutes, you go unconscious, and at five minutes, you begin to suffer irreversible brain damage because of lack of oxygen. Now, my mother, who is sitting right here, she kept saying that that explained a lot of things in my later adolescent years. <laughs> and she can't deny it. She's, she's right here. She can't deny it. Well, I came out during that experience, during those seven minutes underwater, I had the classical near-death experience and the, and the life after death experience that when I came out of it, I realized even then that it was the most amazing thing that had ever happened to a person because it removed from me any shadow of a doubt of an afterlife and of the existence of God. I knew that with absolute certainty that there was an afterlife in the existence of God. Just as certain as you are now that when you leave this auditorium and walk out this door or this door, there's going to be a hallway out there and you're not gonna step off a cliff and go down and fall 30 feet into the abyss. You're certain of that, yes or no? Yes. And just as certain as we are that we're sitting here in Chicago right now having this talk, this presentation, <laughs> are we certain of that? Or are we in Bismarck, University of Mary? And how certain are you of that? Could, is there anything I could say that could convince you to the contrary? And I'm guessing the answer is no. It's with that exact same certainty that I came out having received this very special gift at 13 years. What that did is that took away all fear and any shadow of a doubt about the existence of the afterlife. Well, went through high school, graduated, went to college. Uh, as freshmen in college, we ran in a pack. You know, we, we, we went to movies in a pack, went to restaurants in a pack, went to parties in a pack. We went home for the summer, came back the beginning of the sophomore year at the end of summer, and something horrible had happened. All of my guy friends had gotten girlfriends. <laughs> and worse yet, all of the girls that we ran with had boyfriends, and I wasn't one of them. <laughs> it was terrifying. You know, to be honest, I didn't know how to make a college girlfriend. So I talked to my friends, and they said, go volunteer. So I went to the Campus Volunteer Center, and I looked on all the postings of volunteer opportunities, and I saw one that had 22 girls signed up, <laughs> and no guys, and I wasn't a math major. But I said, I've got a good chance here. It was a crisis line. What would happen is they gave us about a 45-second training period, and then they gave us a cell phone. I mean, they gave us a phone. This is pre-cell phones. They gave us a phone, and we sat down, and we took these calls that came in from boys and girls, men and women, uh, domestic violence, uh, horrible things happening in the homes that I wasn't aware was happening. But they said, do the best you can. OK, just do it. Take the calls. And that introduced me into the underbelly of our society. We're not talking Miami or Los Angeles or Thailand. We're, not, we're talking Bismarck, Dickinson, Fargo, North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Iowa. Domestic violence, drug and alcohol addicted uh, families, sexual abuse within the homes, kids that run away. And when they run away, they're, they're subjected to rape. They're subjected to survival sex on the streets sex in exchange for simply a place to stay. 
kids who are being trapped or tricked into child pornography and then child prostitution. Kids that wanted a way out but didn't know how to get out of that. And so as the calls came in, and that's what we did, and we took the calls. After college, I had great opportunities, job opportunities in the corporate world. But what I did instead was I decided to follow this underground river of runaways that sucks the kids out of the farms and out of the towns and out of the cities and into the big metro and urban areas, sometimes the international markets, and where they sell them just like a commodity. And I, so I went to New York City right out of college, and I did um, work with child prostitutes, runaways, and street gangs. Did that for three years, but while I was there, I learned about this horrible civil war going on down in Central America. And the civil war was happening in El Salvador, Guatemala, and Nicaragua. It's taking about 275,000 people that it had killed, or that it had murdered, or that it disappeared, and hundreds of thousands of kids that were orphaned. And I thought, you know, I can do something. The first lesson from the drowning, don't be afraid. The second lesson, let yourself try. Let yourself experiment, experience new things. Give yourself permission. And even though I didn't speak the language and had no experience and I was very small for my age, I went down there on a six-month commitment. I said, I can do this, I think. But give yourself permission. Give yourself permission to try it. Give yourself permission to succeed. And give yourself permission to fail. Wayne Gretzky once said, you know, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. Likewise, you fail at 100% of the things that you don't try. Give yourself permission to try it. So I got on the plane, went down, very young, didn't speak the language. The plane landed, and I was in the middle of the war zone. And they came up to me and they said, you're the executive director of this war orphanage. And I didn't speak a word of Spanish. And the soldiers were yelling at me and pointing guns at me and telling me to go this way and this way. Again, give it a try. And I said, OK, they need the help. I can do the work. Do it. Uh, what we did in my six months turned into seven years. What we did is we went out and we built orphanages. We built clinics. We built rehabilitation centers. We built homes for children that had lost limbs in the war burn centers for kids that had been hit by phosphorus bombs or napal bombs in El Salvador and in Guatemala. We'd quite often get a telegram or a, a telefax or a knock at the door from someone from the US Embassy or the Archbishop's office or some other federal or government agency. Big massacre, go up and help. The next morning, we'd load everything in the back of Jeeps, medicines, food, clothing, whatever we had, and drive up there, unload it. And quite often, when we were driving away after, taking out, uh, after unloading the supplies, uh, women, grandmothers, who didn't speak a word of Spanish would come up to us in their Mayan languages, pushing the kids through the car windows, pleading with us in Quiche or Mom or Cachiquel to take their kids, give them the greatest gift that they could of love, to take their children to safety. One time we were driving back from a village that we had just dropped off a lot of medicines. and We were going by the River Cajabon, a very big river, about the size of the Missouri River. And uh, we saw this very distressed crowd of villagers so we drove as close as we could, and then we parked. We left the kids who were in the back of the Jeep there waiting, and my colleague and I walked down to the river bit side, and we saw that at a bridge not far up from us, they had pushed a number of bodies over the bridge and into the river. The people were terrified because these were their loved ones. These were their sons and their daughters and their brothers and their sisters and their mothers and their fathers. And they, you know, they didn't want to go out and touch them because they were afraid of recriminations because of the Guatemala National Army. At the same time, these were their loved ones, so they didn't know what to do. I looked at my colleague, and we went in, and we walked into the river. You know, we, we were deciding what we could do, and I saw this one body start to move. So I walked over, and I put my left arm under his head, my right arm under his body, his young boy. He had been shot a number of times. We lifted him up, and he opened his eyes, looked up at me, and they continued to roll back, and I knew that he had died on my arms. Um, we didn't feed the hungry that day in that alongside the river. We did in the village. We didn't there. We had no more clothing to give out. We didn't build homes. We didn't house the homeless. What we did is the best we could. That second big lesson. Do the best you can. Third big lesson. First lesson, don't be afraid. Second lesson, let yourself try. Let yourself let yourself try it. Let yourself succeed. Let yourself fail. And the third lesson, do the best you can. As we go through life, and, and bringing this all in, 
from this experience I had when I was 13 years, which gave me the strength to go out and to, um, to do this. I mean, there's not a reason in the world I should have been doing any of it, except for that drowning experience when I was 13. As we go through life, there's three things we can do when a situation demands action from you, you individually. The first thing we can do is this. Let's say, let's say you and I go up and we're at the Niagara Rivers, okay? There's the waterfalls, and it's beautiful, oh my gosh. We go up and we're taking pictures, and I'm taking pictures here, and you're upstream, and I hear this splash. And all of a sudden, I look up, and you've fallen in the Niagara River, and you're going towards the fall. The first thing we can do is this. We can stand there and do nothing, freeze up, or do a very mild, help, help, help. And what's going to happen to him? Down the river and over the falls, right? In other words, ignore it or, or refuse to engage, even though we know this person needs our help. The second thing we can do is, oh my gosh, and jump into the river. Swim out to him, grab his hand and say, I've got you. And then what's going to happen? We're going to look at each other, smile, as we both go down the river and over the falls together. Not a good plan. The third thing we can do is this. We can take off our burden, take off our backpack, drop our cell phone, drop our camera, run down the river, find a rock to stand on, find a tree to hold on to, pick up a branch, stand on the rock, and bend out. When he floats by, he'll grab it. I can pull him in. That will work. In other words, unload ourselves, not just in this metaphor, but in life. Unload ourselves of the things that are weighing us down and holding us back. Utilizing, taking inventory of our resources. What do we have around us? Our health, our finances, our family, our friends, our education, our community, our networks. Take an inventory of your resources. Find a position of strength and use that position of strength to help the people who need you as they go floating by, as in the situation that demands it. Those are the only three options. I have never found a fourth option. Don't worry what people say about you. The fear of what people say about us is the number one fear in the world. You'll read that the fear of public speaking is the number one fear, but that's because people are afraid of what they'll say about you, or the fear of getting involved but that's because people are afraid of what they'll say about you. Don't be afraid because, again, I lost that fear when I was a 13-year-old boy and drowned for seven minutes. Not because of the irreversible brain damage, mom, <laughs> but because I learned of the infinity spectrum of time. And how, what people say today makes no difference. It makes no difference. They'll, they'll, they'll push, push, push you up on a pedestal. And then when you're up there, they'll throw, throw, throw rocks at you. Why? I don't know. But they do. Okay? Again, you don't care because it means nothing in the big spectrum of time. And big spectrum of time isn't today, tomorrow, this week, or next month. I've had people tell me I'm wonderful. And I've had people tell me I'm horrible. And mom, yes, you have said that. <laughs> okay. Again, don't worry what people say because it makes no difference. It's like going in and getting a vaccination shot. It's like going in and getting a vaccination shot. If I could give you a vaccination that would cure all of your diseases for the rest of your life, and yet it, was, it took just 30 seconds of pain, of a sting, you would say, absolutely, give it to me. It's the same thing. What they say today, the sting is gone tomorrow. The good works that you do, however, are with you forever, are with you forever. Don't be afraid. Let that, go, let that happen. People will praise you, and they'll knock you down. Your journey is going to be different than mine. Okay? You're not going to do the same thing I've done. What you're going to do is totally different. Maybe you're not going to go work in war zones. Maybe you're not going to work with child prostitutes or runaways or be shot at or be caught in bombings. Um, I bet that's been my journey. Your journey is going to be different. Your journey is going to be fantastic if you give yourself permission, if you let yourself do it. Okay? Uh, over the years, I've adopted 17 boys and girls, nine boys, eight girls, kids, different situations, raised them into adulthood in my home. Um, six of them have passed away. One of the kids is Julio Rene. All of the kids, I talked talk to them, and I said, dream, 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 dream. Live your dreams, be your dreams, make your dreams happen, 
Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Give yourself permission to try, succeed, and to fail, and do what you can, all right? Um, I say that again to you right now. Please, live your dreams. Don't be afraid. If you, had, if you could have tomorrow and the rest of your life without worrying what anybody thought about you, what would you do? Your day starts over every day. Go to it. Thank you. Thank you.